Good evening, everyone. My name is Lupe Ferrer. As president of Future Healthcare Professionals, it is an honor to welcome you this evening. Future Healthcare Professionals, also known as FHCP, is a student organization focused on providing intentional co-curricular and interprofessional experiences for our members. It is our privilege to host the second annual College of Health Professions Allied Health Week keynote speaker for this evening. Before we proceed with our planned events, we have an exciting announcement to make. <clears throat> Part of the duties of the executive board of FHCP is to facilitate the Peter Cohen Leadership in Healthcare Scholarship. This scholarship is awarded to a first semester freshman who is enrolled full time and has declared a major or pre-major within the College of Health Professions. Applicants must submit an activities chart showing community involvement and leadership experience as well as a personal statement explaining why they chose to pursue a career in healthcare along with their education and career goals. We had an incredibly talented pool of applicants this year. Overall, our recipient stood out due to her passion for a career in healthcare, her commitment to her education, and her involvement in the community. Please help us congratulate our 2017 Peter Cohen Leadership and Healthcare Scholarship recipient, Sonia Ahmed. Again, another round of applause for Sonia. Okay. Health Corps Clinic began when a group of concerned students, concerned citizens gathered, gathered in the early 1990s to address the disproportionate rates of illnesses affecting individuals in the local community. In 1998, Health Corps Clinic opened its doors as the Center for Health and Wellness with a focus on prevention, education, and wellness, as well as a vision to promote a health community regardless of one's ability to pay. Teresa Lovelady joined the Health Corps Clinic as President and Chief Executive Officer in March 2011. Teresa has been a medical patient at the center since 2003 and served as a consumer board member since May 2009. She brought a wealth of experience to the board as a patient and as a professional in the mental health field. Previously, Ms. Lovelady served as the Vice President of Prevention and Advocacy at the Mental Health Association of South Central Kansas. Teresa has served on many task forces, coalitions, and com communities, and committees including National Mental Health America, Visioneering Wichita, African American Coalition, the Boys and Girls Club of South Central Kansas, Wichita State University, Wichita Public Schools, Social Rehabilitation Services, Statewide Review of Disparities in the Child Welfare System, and ComCare in addressing needs of disadvantaged persons, particularly children. Teresa has demonstrated leadership and excellence by being a team player willing to negotiate and mediate for win-win situations, and serving as a positive role model within the community. Teresa was a member of the 2014 Class of Advocacy Fellows and was recently awarded the Wichita Business Journal 2017 Healthcare Hero Award. Please help me welcome Teresa Lovelady to the stage. Thank you very much, Lupe. I appreciate you. And thank you, Wilshock, for the wonderful escort here. And it's funny, in 2002, I actually got to dress up as Wilshock. And so, there we go, I, I really appreciate that. Your outfit looks a lot better than mine was. I had this huge thing that hurt your shoulders, but thank you, thank you so very much. <laughs> All right, well, well guys, we're gonna have, uh, well first I'm gonna thank you guys. I wanna thank the College of Health Professions for allowing me to share in your second annual uh, College of Health Professions Week. And I want to thank Dean Bibbs for inviting me and uh, actually working with Health Corps Clinic and working with uh, me personally and looking at some of the um, issues or concerns in our community as well as uh, what we can do to help improve uh, learning so that we can connect it appropriately to the workplace. I also want to thank Gina for coordinating and going back and forth uh, with getting everything arranged. 
So if you guys don't mind, I'm a little unorthodox in sometimes how I give a presentation. Um, I'm gonna use myself as an example here. Sometimes when we think about and look at the social determinants of health, we don't necessarily look at um, the human side to it, the person side. So I'm gonna start off with uh, reciting a poem. Can I walk away from the mic now? I should be, if not, I have a big mouth. There we go. Um, look at me. I know that I'm beautiful. I know that I'm strong, even though I can't feel it. Life slaps me down every time I stand. Corruption and chaos destroys my visibility of happiness. I feel so alone. No one believes in me. People are afraid of me. And sometimes I scare myself. I don't know what to do. I'm lost and confused in a society that doesn't understand or comprehends right from wrong, positive from negative. I had no father. My mother was solo, weary, shaken, insufficient. She could not guide me through this cruel world alone. So I fantasize. Drugs? No, just say no, because I must learn to love myself, even if no one else does. Am I a product of my circumstances? Is it me or is it society? But life seems so hard. Why am I even here? You know what? I need more than superficial heroes and role models. I need a real voice. I need a real chance. Don't categorize me from the color of my skin, from the way that I talk, from the neighborhood I live, but place me in a category that is determined to break cycles and cast an uprise on its people, not in crime, but in success. I was once the young and confused. I was part of Generation X. And I share that with you guys. It's actually a poem I wrote when I was 17 years old. And when I was 17 years old, I was born and raised in Chicago. I was a high school dropout three times before I graduated. I grew up on the south side of Chicago. I was a homeless kid at 15 years old. I've actually never lived with an adult since I was 15 years old, if you can imagine that. I also raised my two younger brothers. So I was 15, they were 13 and 12. Uh, the first time my little brother got shot, he was six, and I was nine. And we lived in the projects in Chicago, and the two buildings were at war with each other. And they were shooting across, and we were going through the field to go to the candy store. And sadly, as a kid, I knew the difference between a 22 automatic, semi-automatic, shotgun, sawed-off shotgun, all the different types of guns. We knew this. And we knew that if you heard like certain types of sounds, you better run fast for cover. And so once we heard the shots, we ran. We ran across the field and I turned around and my little brother was calling my name. And so when I looked back and I saw my little brother who was all of six years old laying on the ground, I had to come up with what am I gonna do? Am I gonna run back into the war zone, pick him up, carry him to safety? Or am I too afraid and I'm going to stand on the side with everybody else? So if you guys can imagine, of course, I ran and I picked my little brother up and I carried him back to the safe zone until the ambulance could come. And he was shot in his leg, actually shattered his ankle. And he still kind of walks with a limp today. But that was the first time he was shot. The second time he was shot, he was 15 years old. He was shot in his neck. The bullet went to his heart, top palate there and it came out his two front teeth. And so right now to this day, he doesn't have two front teeth. Thank God he's still alive, right? I had to put that in there. I didn't want to scare you guys there. Um, but this kind of gives you an idea. And I'll never forget, I went to the hospital, and because at that time I was 17 turning 18, and he was about 14, 15, he went to the pediatric area, right? Because he was a kid. But this kid had been shot twice. Not at the same time, but twice in his life. You know, and so um, the irony there, so I had to go and find my mom because as a teen myself and then my little brother's hurt, I, could, I had no rights. I, had, like, I couldn't sign off on anything or, or uh, kind of help him in that way. So I had to go find my mom or my dad. Okay, so my dad was on drugs really bad. We could hardly find him, but I knew that I can probably find my mom. And then convince her, you gotta go to the hospital and see about our little brother. You know, 
And so um, just so many different things in life. When we think about the social determinants of health, and I, I'm sharing myself as an example, when we look at what the social determinants of health are and how they impact individuals in a negative way, and you as future health professionals, what you guys could do in, in whatever respective position that is, whether you're a nurse, you're a physician assistant, you're a physical therapist, whatever interact, interaction you have with individuals from, um, from the perspective of health, you have a unique opportunity to really not judge someone based on their skin complexion, where they're from, any of those different things, but to really look at them from where they come from and make certain that you always have that in your heart. Because sometimes you're probably not gonna learn this as you go through the WSU wonderful College of Health Professions. You're gonna work with different people from different places, different areas around the world, all these wonderful different things, but you have to make a commitment to really set aside some of your own personal thoughts or concerns so that you're looking at people not just as a diagnosis of disease or an outcome of their society, uh, societal factors, but you're looking at them as individuals and people. Because when Lupe introduced me, you probably were thinking like that girl who was raised by the Cosby family is gonna come up here. How does she make it to be the CEO? And she's the VP of this, woo woo woo, all those different things. But if I, that's just a snippet. Okay, the other part, when we talk about the social determinants of health, I want to, I don't know if you guys are really familiar with uh, what they are, I won't make that assumption, but the social determinants of health, it looks at the social and economic environment that people come from or that they live in. It looks at the physical environment. So going back to my example, when we lived in the projects in Chicago, the social and economic environment was pretty rough. The projects I grew up in, we were, I went back later in life and I looked at, um, you can Google and look at the poorest zip codes in the country. I actually grew up in the poorest zip code in the United States of America in Chicago. 3549 South Federal, apartment 406, 60609. My phone number was 3732203. No. <laughs> Some things we, we never forget. But that was one of the poorest neighborhoods in the country, not in Chicago, not in Illinois, but in the entire United States of America. And it was just literally two project buildings that was right there next, 60609 inc incorporated those two buildings there. Um, but those two buildings were the beginning of 42 high rise buildings that were 17 stories tall. There were two blocks in each, I mean, two buildings, two of these buildings in each block. And on each floor, there were 14 apartments. You had so many poor people. You know, it was really cool. Every year, two people would graduate from high school from all these buildings, like all the ones I could look at. And we'd all go up to the like fourth or fifth floor, overlook these kids going on prom. Two kids. So if two kids from all of this right here actually made it out, how many didn't make it? You know? So when we look at our physical environment, that impacts, that has a huge impact on our health. Where do we actually live? What resources are there? What uh, educational systems are there? What's going on? Is there lead in the water? Is there no fluoride in the water? You know? Um, then we also, on the social determinants of health, we look at a person's individual characteristics and behaviors. So going back to the social and economic, we look at income and social status. We look at social support networks. So what's available to help that person? We look at education and literacy. You know, can they, can they read, can they write? Can they understand, can they interact with what's going on with them? If you write them a prescription, do they understand what you're asking them to do? I mean, personally, I work in healthcare, I'm the CEO of a community health center, and I can't enunciate half the medications when the doctors are talking, I'm like, you know, and some of you guys get me right. <laughs> some of the things, it's like, it's so advanced, and so I can't even imagine a patient with very low literacy, uh, very low health literacy, you know, how are they interacting? Are they just going like this because they don't want to seem as if they're ignorant or they don't know or they don't understand? Um, employment and working conditions. Are there opportunities to be employed to improve their life? Are there opportunities uh, even with how they're working? Are they overworked? Um, is there adequate work? Are they taken advantage of at work? 
Are they immigrant workers? Are they undocumented workers? I can tell you with some of the things that's going on politically, we've seen a huge decrease in Hispanic patients at the clinic. I know Hispanic patients' health hasn't miraculously improved to the point that they don't have to come to the clinic anymore, but think about the political environment right now that's preventing individuals from just seeking their basic needs, from going to work, from sending their kids to school, from seeking health care services. We have pregnant women that are undocumented but afraid to go to the doctor for fear that someone's going to tell their immigration status and they're not going to get, I mean, they're going to be deported. So imagine that. You know, so when we look at our environment, we have to look at you know, the political environment as well. And so that's that social environment. So we have the physical environments we talked about. We have those personal health practices and coping skills. I honestly believe that I'm able to stand here today, the person I am, because somewhere in my life early on, and I can tell you it was Ms. Ziering in kindergarten when I was in special ed because I had a speech impediment. Yes, I couldn't even enunciate my name when I was five. Like, if you asked me what my name was, it was like, I can be like, what? And so, thank goodness I had a, <laughs> I was a good test taker. So I couldn't talk, but I could take tests. So any speech pathologist, future people in the room? No, no speech pathologist. Isn't that under health college? We're going to get that group. <laughs> but yeah, I couldn't, even, I couldn't even enunciate my name. I couldn't communicate, not verbally with people. I could talk at home because in my household it was okay to speak broken English inappropriately and, and somehow in your homes you understand you're able to communicate in that way. But I could not communicate with people outside of my home so I had to go to special ed. Um, in my um, elementary school and my special ed teacher told me, I'll never forget, she told me I was not dumb, that I was smart and I was brilliant and I one day grew up and be somebody incredible. She told me that. And I believed her. So I believe with her supporting me and helping me build those coping skills at a young age helped me carry through so many other difficult moments in my life. Um, also, healthy child development. So when we think about if we could touch a child and give them re the resources they need when they're very young, you could change a child's life. You can change a person's life. So have an appropriate um, um, healthy child development. So I go back and say, Ms. Ziering, she was that piece for me. You know, she connected me to other services. So not only was she my special ed teacher, she became kind of my life coach, if I think about that at five years old kindergarten life coach. But she, that's what she was, because she didn't leave me. I mean, literally, she was my personal life coach, I'm going to call her that, all the way until I was in fifth grade. She was my strongest advocate. I'll never forget, it turned out that not uh, I wasn't dumb, right, because I couldn't talk. When she taught me how to talk and how to speak better, then she found out that I was probably gifted. And so she tried to convince my mom to allow me to double in first grade and in third grade. Simultaneously, my older brother was failing. So he failed twice. I doubled twice. He's three years older than me, and we would have been in the same grade. So my mom didn't want him to be embarrassed, so she figured I need to learn everything I could. So Ms. Ziering took a liking to me and she gave me all these special extra things because otherwise I probably would have been that bad kid in class that was talking too much because I did all the work and I'm like, was bored. So she took me and had me doing all this other stuff. Um, but then we look at health services, when we look at social determinants of health. And when we talk about health services, we're talking real access to health services. Now, Sadly, in Wichita, we have one of the highest infant mortality rates in the country. And the infant mortality rate is measured by the number of babies who do not make it to their first birthday. Okay? The average is six babies born will not make it, six of 1,000 babies will not make it to their first birthday. Do you know two blocks, block and a half, right across the street from Wichita State University, that number is 18 to 20 babies per 1,000 babies will not make it to their first birthday. That's called a health disparity. And if we think about a community where our babies are at highest risk, the babies, who's not caring about babies, right? Who's not caring about babies? Then what does that do for all other health risk factors in our community? 
if we can't do the basics to make certain our babies are protected. So when we think about health services, we have to think about real access. Okay, I'm trying to get savvy here, Lupe. What is it, hashtag real access. <laughs> real access means if I'm a patient and I need access to health care, I shouldn't have to jump through so many loops when I show up at one of the health facilities around town. Like, you shouldn't play the games when you're like, oh, you're 15 minutes late. Oh, you don't have health insurance? Oh, we're going to have to reschedule you. It shouldn't be, oh, man, you didn't dot the I on the bottom of the form. No, no, you, you, you didn't dot it. You, like, crossed it out. Sorry, I can't give you access right now. But if you have health insurance, come on in. Because guess what? The people with health insurance, they probably have great income and social status. They probably have great social support networks. They have, they're educated. They have great health literacy. They have employment, good employment and working conditions, great social environments. When we talk about access to health services, we're talking about those that really need access to health services. And if they don't get it, it it's like it's a matter of life and death. It's not like a luxury or a convenience. It's like, I'm going to live or I'm going to die. Okay? I think about, when I think back on my family, the oldest person in my family, oh, she just turned 60. That's the oldest person in my family. And before her, the oldest person in my family was 52. Okay? And the oldest person in my family happens to be my mom now. She had seven siblings older than her. Okay, so when in my family, I had a family member that died every year from preventable types of things. You know, we had, uh, what, what's a big one? Diabetes, you know, they called it sugar. Grandmama had sugar. Grandmama didn't make it because she had sugar. And so I'm a kid, I'm like, sugar, man, sugar's that bad? But what did we do? We put sugar on everything, right? Put sugar on your rice, sugar in Kool-Aid, sugar on everything, like just sugar on eggs, like that's gross, but we put sugar on everything. So you're like, but grandma had sugar, right? Then we have uh, hypertension. Nobody can really pronounce that in most health, illiterate, health illiterate families. So we don't call it high, high, uh, hypertension. We call it what? High blood pressure. My blood pressure real high. You know? And then well, you don't even know what controlled blood pressure looks like. So then you're like, well, I can't eat the salt. We finally made the connection with salt and high blood pressure in poor neighborhoods, poor families. So let's think about, let's see, we talked about, uh, well, we didn't hit culture yet. So my Thanksgiving dinner growing up, woo, it had everything grandmama shouldn't have had and everything Uncle Tommy didn't need to eat because it's hypertension and grandma's uh, sugar. But we ate it because culturally, that's what it meant to have Thanksgiving dinner. Right? We had stuff we shouldn't even eat. But that's how we were raised. So when we talk about um, the impact of not having appropriate access to health care, it, it literally is a life or death situation. So people are dying from preventable diseases and families are being destroyed and families are being broken down because they don't have adequate health care support. I mean, adequate access to health care services. I mean, the youngest person in my family, I think he was 22. Um, and he died from, um, he actually was diagnosed with cancer. He was 21, and he had bone cancer, but he always had back pains growing up. So I'm thinking if somebody at some point would have been like, let's take him in and see what's going on with his back, maybe that could have been diagnosed earlier. You know, I had another aunt, she had lupus, I guess, whatever that was, sickle cell anemia, you know, like what is that? You know, all these different things. So you have, if, if we're able to get people into, if they have real access, access to health services and at those health facilities, you have programs and services that allow people to improve their health and that you as future college, I mean, future health professionals are able to be a part of that process, then you will be a part of changing lives and extending people's lives. And then maybe, you know, the oldest person and someone's family could be in their 80s or 90s. Well, guess what? Maybe they can live to be 100, 105. Also, when we look at uh, social determinants of health, the things we can't change are biology, gender, and culture. You know, those are things we can't change. But for those things you can, then be a part of that process, be a part of that transition. One of, any questions right there? I know we have, uh, I wasn't sure if it was going to be in the end or 
uh, for questions, any questions about the social determinants of health, because that's something that's very important as you guys move along in, in uh, your pursuit or your career in health uh, professions. I can tell you, if I interviewed someone and in the interview, they start talking about social determinants of health, I don't care what they were interviewing for, I probably want them on my team. I'm gonna find a job for you. It's like, well, you really, you get that? Okay, hmm, let's see where we can get this person in here within the organization. So that's something that's critical, and most people don't really know a whole bunch about that. Something else I wanna to talk to you about is patient-centered care. It goes back to social determinants of health, but it's making certain that the patient, you're wrapping your healthcare services around a patient. And patient-centered care looks like the patient's in the middle, they're informed enough to be a part of the process, you're not in control of their health care because guess what? You can't, you're with them for 15 minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, an hour, however long you're with them. But that patient's on their own to deal with whatever it is you told them to do when they're not around you. So you have to figure out a way to make the patient engage them as part of that process. So patient-centered medic medicine is, is a critical um, part of what medicine is today. So in order for you to, again, understand what your patient's needs are and to be able to interact with them appropriately, you do have to understand some of those other factors around the social determinants of health. For instance, if someone's not coming to their appointment and you've never asked them why aren't you coming and you're just assuming they're lazy, they're tired, all these other things, but when you ask them that question and they say, well, I don't have a car, and you're not on the bus route, and so there's no way for me to get here. But if you, then you're like, oh, well, let's kind of problem solve around that. So sometimes taking that extra step to listen to the patient so that you can help them be engaged and be a part of that process. Something else that, that's also going on in healthcare right now is integrated care. And that's what I love, love, love about Health Court Clinic. I started out there as a patient. I had a nine-year-old and a three, four-year-old, and my four-year-old was diagnosed with asthma. I didn't know what asthma was. I mean, I thought he just had, like, the sniffles or, I mean, he made this funny sound in the morning. <laughs> Remember? <laughs> and I'm like, what is? So I, he did it all his whole life, but I didn't know that was asthma. I wasn't educated or informed in that way. And so when he went to school, he went to um, preschool, they were like, whoa, your son has asthma. You need to probably take him to the doctor and get that checked out. So I took him um, to the, well, I found myself, I was uninsured at the time. I was going back to school myself to advance my education because I had two kids, single mom, and I did not want my kids to grow up the way that I did. So I did my best, I made it through college, which maybe I'll touch back on that if we have some time, but I just wanted to have a better life. So I was going back to get my master's at this point, so I was uninsured because I couldn't afford health insurance and pay the rent, okay? Because health insurance was so expensive that I could, we could either have like Blue Cross Blue Shield and be homeless or have a place and pray we don't get sick. Yeah, kind of deal. So um, my son ended up with asthma, so of course, now I gotta get at the access health care. So I went to a couple, I went to Sedgwick County Health Department. They were like, no, we don't do that. We only deal with um, high risk pregnant women. I was like, whoa, where do I go? And I said, well, you can go to some of these clinics that are around town. And so that's when I found uh, Center for Health and Wellness or Health Court Clinic. Uh, we're Health Court Clinic now. And so I came there and I'll never forget, they had a program called Smart Start. And through the Smart Start program, my son was able to get not only his uh, appointment for free, um, but he was able to come back for all his sick and well child visits, get his immunizations, everything. And I was like, wow, this place is great. You know, so I came back and then when I did get insurance, I brought my insurance card so I can help leverage care for somebody else who didn't have health insurance. And eventually I served on the board as a consumer bo board member because I was that patient too, right? I was that patient that would call and say, y'all messed up my whatever. And so they'd be like, oh God, here comes Teresa, right? <laughs> Which is funny, because now I get those patients coming and I'm looking for them in the lobby because I remember being that patient. So I don't mind serving them because sometimes it's just lack of communication or something's broken down or someone being treated or they feel like they're being treated um, differently. You know, sometimes it's as simple as that. But anyhow, um, coming to Health Court Clinic, uh, <laughs> 
as a patient, transitioning as a board member, and then eventually serving in the CEO role. And one of the first things that I wanted to do is make certain that we had real access to healthcare, that we weren't discriminating against any patient, any diagnosis, anyone who comes to the door. Nobody's turned away, regardless of their ability to pay, regardless of if we need to hire a translator that speaks Swahili and Kinyaranda and whatever language. We speak over 15 languages uh, there at the clinic. Um, but we make certain we serve our community. Uh, when I came there, it was, uh, oh my goodness, Dean Bibbs, we, we were about bankrupt. Uh, the first three months, I, they couldn't even afford to pay me, right? Oh, my husband's back there too. I saw him. He, so they weren't even able to pay us. And my husband was like, what? You're not getting paid? <laughs> uh, but at the same time, I was nine months pregnant with my third child. And so it was kind of like, oh my goodness, I come to this place and we want to make certain that there's access to health care and we want to make certain that there's integrated care because I knew that there were gaps in the community. So I knew that accessing behavioral health services was very difficult unless you were really, really, really sick, like really sick. There was, there was, very, there was very little preventative mental health services in our community. I knew that accessing um, dentistry, dental services is pretty difficult. If you don't have really good, was it Delta Dental or a lot of cash, you got a toothache, they're either, if it's real bad, you can go to the emergency room, they'll yank it out. Otherwise, I mean, it's very difficult to get access to dental care. Um, at the new clinic, we're also incorporating legal services. We're putting a pharmacy in the clinic. So we have all these different services, integrated services that are gonna work together to help create real access to a lot of different needs in our community. Um, finally, I wanna talk to you guys about how um, Any of you interested in going into healthcare leadership, okay? Or leadership period. Because if you're good, guess what? Somebody's gonna ask you to lead something. And little bit you guys know, you're probably all leaders right now in your own life, your own personal, personal life. You're probably the one everybody leans on when stuff hits the fan. You're probably the one that, um, if there's an issue or concern, you gotta bring something like this together, right, Lupe? You're like that natural leader where you were voted or something, I'm sure, but <laughs> being a leader of your group. But if you want to be a leader, leadership is not just a position, okay? It's not a position. It's, it's not a position. So if you think you can be the leader because you got the position, yeah, people might not respect you. They might follow because they have to follow you because you have that position might not like you, you know, and as soon as you don't have that position anymore, they don't really care about you, don't trust you or anything in that way. But when you think about leadership, let's think about, let's look at it as um, you have to have scholarship and or around the principles of scholarship. So you got to know something for people to want to follow you, okay? And to whomsoever much is given, much of him shall be required. And if you want to be an exceptional leader or an exceptional person, you got to rem remember to give back and to serve others in that way. Um, character, you got to have a real character. You, you have to have, you have to be authentic. Don't be phony. Be you, because everybody else is taken. No. Be you, because you're unique. You're, you're authentic, you're real. You can be the best you you can be. It's hard to be somebody else. Plus, if you're trying to be somebody else, guess what, eventually, you're gonna fail at trying to be something that's not you. So be, be the real you. Uh, be open about your failures and shortcomings. Nobody's perfect. If you, if you never make a mistake, that's, that's unrealistic. You're, you're like living in denial or something. We make mistakes all the time. I don't know how many of you have been going to WSU, but uh, finally that building right there, three blocks west of, 20, of uh, WSU on 21st and Erie, Oh my goodness, that's been six years in the making. And most people look up and say, oh, that's so pretty, what is that? They don't see all the failures and shortcomings and whew, I could just breathe right there. Um, but through the failures and through the valleys, we grow, right? Because it gives us time to go back and think through. It's like, oh, okay, let me, let me do this a different way and have you come up with a better solution. So it's okay not to be perfect. It's okay to fail. 
That's where you learn, that's where you grow, that's where you become better. That's when you hone your craft because it humbles you. You go back and like, oh man, I messed up. Let me pick it up and try again. It's the not picking it up and try again that gets you. Because I think back, um, again, in my own personal journey. You know, when I was 15, when I became a homeless kid, if I would have given up, where would I be today? You know, where would the 6,000 people that this clinic serves today, where would they be? You know, who would be standing at the helm to make certain they have real access to health care? So no matter what, never give up. Never give up. Service. So the best way to find yourself is to lose yourself in the service of others. And the most important habit for any person is to give more than what you receive. Okay? Sometimes you always heard it's like at Christmas time, right? It's better to give than to receive. Think about it. If you're giving somebody something then you, and you don't need to receive anything, you're a little bit better off than a person who needs to receive whatever it is that you have to give them. And I truly believe, I, I'm, I'm strong on my faith, that he will bless you with all that you need if you're willing to give to others. It'll be replaced tenfold. I truly believe that. Well, I'm, again, living witness because I remember having nothing. I mean, I remember sleeping in the back of a car. The safest place to be in Chicago as a young woman at 15 years old was in the back of the car, parked at the police station because they towed somebody's car in. So that was safe because they normally would not lock the cars because they didn't have the keys. And it was on a police parking lot. So if something happened, I could hurry up and try to run into the police station. So it was a safe place. Finally, leadership. Everything rises and falls with leadership. And again, you don't have to be the CEO. You don't have to be, you can lead in whatever position you're in now. And if you're going to be a leader, you have to serve others. You have to have a, pers a purpose. So why are you, are, are you, if you're just trying to be the leader because you want the title or you want the recognition, it's not going to work. You're not going to be a leader long. You have to want to do it because you want to contribute something back and you, you have a purpose on why you're trying to lead individuals. You also have to have integrity. Integrity. If people don't believe in you, how, how can you build trust? Again, our project is a $10.7 million project. And you know, no bank in Wichita would finance us. I had to go all the way out to New York and find a, a financial, is it community, financial development institution that would, that I could convince them to give us $10.7 million to build this wonderful facility. And if I didn't have integrity, do you think these people from New York, and now we're talking New York, would have trusted some little lady from Kansas? So you have to have integrity. And then you have to have integrity enough that other people from the outside of your organization or your group are looking at you and they can see and they can acknowledge that integrity from your actions and your interactions with others. Relationships, you gotta be real. That goes back to being authentic. Be yourself, be real, be you. And then renewal, okay. My husband's here and, and my daughter's actually here too and my grandbaby's here, but I am so horrible at taking care of myself. Like I'm the burnout queen. If there was a picture in the dictionary next to burnout, I'd be there like this. I mean, I would be that person. Uh, and sometimes we forget that we're giving so much to others. We're being a servant, servant leader. We're, we're, we have purpose. We have integrity. We're doing these different things, but we forget to take care of ourselves. And especially in the health profession, we are like the biggest culprits. Like we so, well, we got to serve the next patient after the next one. We got to take care of another person. We got to take care of everybody. We're going to save the world. But what happens if you fly and get on the airplane? What do they say? Put on your mask before you try to save somebody else and put their mask on. So make sure you take care of yourself. And again, I, I feel like I'm a hypocrite standing here telling you to take care of yourself. And, and I got two witnesses that will vouch as soon as I leave this room, like, mm-hmm, practice what you preach, mama. Practice what you preach. But take care of yourself. You know, find things that you love to do so that you don't burn out from the profession because we need you. We need you. If you're a caring, loving, supportive individual that, that's 
like has great, you're smart, you're brilliant, you want to go in. You don't ever know. You could find the next cure to whatever, put a disease there, you know, but you can't do it if you burn out before you get started. And then finally, let's look at grit. Man, grit is like not giving up. No matter what, no matter what obstacle comes your way, don't give up. Keep thinking. That's grit. Like if you rub, uh, what is it, to get a diamond, it goes through so much to make precious stones, but that's like grit. That's something rubbing against something. Those are obstacles. Those are things that, that are difficult to overcome. Those are the valleys. Those are people telling you no. Those are things where you think, oh, I can never make it past this point. But if you keep thinking and you never give up and never give up on yourself, that grit will make you a better person all the way around. And, and I know it's true because I stand here again before you a statistic that should have like never made it. I should have never made it out of those projects in Chicago. I should have probably been shot down right next to my brother when I picked up my six-year-old. I'd have been a nine-year-old kid dead and guess what? Nobody would have ever wrote about it, read about it or anything. You know, when I was 15 and my mom kicked me out the house, horrible stuff happened. I could have just laid there and said, you know what, whoa me, I'm just going to be the victim. You know, but you never give up. The first time I dropped out of high school, I dropped out because I got a C in calculus. Now this little girl, she was going to college. My uncle told me that if I got all A's in high school, I could go to whatever college I wanted to go to. I mean, we were dirt poor again, so I'm like, whoa. My goal was to get all A's in high school. So my freshman year, all A's. I had honor classes. I had like a 4.5 GPA. There was 1,400 kids in my freshman class, and I was number three. And Dern, Wanda, and Terrence, they had community service hours. <sighs> they were one and two. So I'm like, Dern. So then my sophomore year did extremely well. And then my mom kicked me out of the house my sophomore year. And my two little brothers left too because we were kind of a family. So here I am at 15 trying to take care of my two little brothers. So it was very difficult for me, but I made it through, still had all A's my uh, sophomore year. Went back to school my junior year, first semester, or not even the semester, the marking period. I got a C in calculus. And I was so disappointed because now I couldn't go to college. And unfortunately, my uncle, who told me that I can go to college if I got all A's, he died at 34 uh, from um, AIDS, HIV AIDS. And so there he goes. I'm like, darn, but he didn't tell me how. So I quit and I gave up on myself, you know? And then I went through so many things in life and I'm like, oh man, the one thing that I loved and my one coping skill that Ms. Ziering instilled in me was education. So I gotta get back in school. Gotta go, right? That's the one thing that I knew that I could be great at. That was the authentic me. I was a learner, so I, got, I had to get back in that area. So I went back up to my high school, and I'm like, please, 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 let me in, let me in, let me back in. I want to go to school. And they're like, oh, okay, they let me back in. But guess what? I dropped out again because I had nowhere to live. I was like sleeping in the back seat of cars. I was, uh, I was a squatter, so if I was at your house, right, I didn't even know you. I'm like, hey, girl, you got a nice purple shirt. Mm -hmm, you like my gold scarf? I'm just following you around. Next thing you know, I'm at your house, and, and your mom's like, when is she going home? Like, where is her pants? Where is her pants? So then I go over, and I'm like, hey, I like your head thing. What is that called? OK, yeah, so where do you? Oh, no, your mom don't play that. OK, I'm going to have to go over here. Hey, girl. You like these pants I have? I like your pants. You want to swap pants? So I'm hanging out with you. I don't even know you. Okay? But you got to do what you got to do to make it. You know? And then sometimes I show up with my two little brothers. Like, never mind them. They're hungry too. Y'all got extra oodles and noodles for all of us? You know? So sometimes it, it gets pretty tough. But I didn't quit. You know, I didn't quit. I, I stopped during that process because, again, it was like, what do you do? What do you do when you don't have those basic needs met to kind of keep going? And that went into a really tough time in my life. So it's like, oh, man, I don't even remember what happened during that time in my life, to be completely honest. And so here comes my senior year. And I'm like, forget it. I'm going to go big again, right? So I go back, and I'm like, please, please, please let me in. Please let me in again. 
And they're like, ah, you got to bring your mom this time. So again, I got to go find my mom. Well, I brought my dad. I, it was easy to find my dad. All I had to do was give him 20 bucks. He'd do anything, right? So I'm like, dad, come up to the school with me. And he's like, ah. Oh. So he comes up. And they're like, nah, nah, we need your mama. So I'm like, man. So I convinced my mom. And my mom, she comes up to the school on her own time. She literally cussed me out in front of everybody. And that's why you ain't going to never be nothing. But, but that's what she told me my whole life. I would never be anything. I thought I was smart, you know. And so to even have her there, I'll never forget the, the school office person was like, whoa, this was like one of our best students ever. Is that really her mom? They had never met her before. And so they allowed, I think they had sympathy and they allowed me back in the school. So here I am. And because I had been such a great student, they allowed me to graduate with my class, right? So I come back and I'm, I'm all excited. I had to take one night class. And guess what? Right in October, 17 years old, I found out I'm pregnant. And in Chicago, you know, they had a pregnant girl's school. But boy, 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 the list was so long. I think you had to, like, pre-register and enroll two years before you thought you were going to get pregnant to get in that school. So, I mean, who's planning teen pregnancies, right? So, <laughs> so anyhow, I couldn't, I couldn't go to school again. So now here I am, 17 years old, pregnant, high school dropout. You know, I'm like, ah, oh, man, I'm back in this cycle, this generational cycle. I don't want that. And the poem that I started out, the presentation with, I wrote that poem then at one of the lowest points in my life. I'm like, what is going on? And I'll never forget, forget that when my daughter was born, I looked at her and I made a commitment, I made a promise. And I said, you know what? I'm going to be the best mama I can be. And we're going to have a great life. And you're going to have an incredible life. And you know what? I'm going to make you proud. I'm going to be a great role model. And this is the same little girl who didn't even know how to make a bottle. Like my 15-year-old brother, who had already had a kid, taught me how to make a bottle for my baby. So here we all are, we're squatters in this abandoned apartment building with our babies, and uh, my little brother is teaching me uh, things to be a better mom or how to just take care of my child. And so looking at that environment, looking at my daughter and making that promise to her, again, never giving up grit. And so, again, I stand here before you today with who I am, and my daughter's actually right there, too. So she's 23 years old. <laughs> she's a graduate from Howard University in Washington, D.C. With, uh, with honors. And, uh, and I got to go to her graduation, and I just couldn't believe it. I sat there and was like, wow. From a generational perspective, was I able to come from the poorest neighborhood in Chicago and endure all those different things? and stand here before you today as the CEO of a health center that serves the community, that gives back, but then also overcome some of those personal obstacles in my life. That's grit, guys. Well, grit and God, but however you acknowledge that, whatever your God is, believe in something bigger than you, but never give up. Never give up. Okay, with that said, I think, I don't know, I didn't bring my little buzz thing, time thing with me, but um, I thank you guys so very much for allowing me to share me with you. Um, and I thank my family. I thank you, Naya, for allowing me to use you as an example there. And I thank my husband for um, always being supportive because without them, there is no me. Um, because I truly believe that um, I don't know what I would have done without my daughter being there and my, at that point in my life where it gave me something to push me through. And whenever I felt like giving up, I never gave up. You know, so I went on to get a bachelor's in uh, business. I went on to get a master's in social work, a master's in business. I'm a certified substance abuse counselor. I mean, all these different things because I never wanted to give up. So you guys never give up. Be the best health professional you can be. Remember to look at those social determinants of health. Never judge the book by the cover. Never look at the title and judge the person by the title. Everyone's unique, just like you're unique. And we all contribute to the greater good. That's it. Um, so I just want to say thank you, Teresa. Um, that, was, that was quite a message. You're a beautiful person, beautiful life. You thank enjoyed you. that. Um, for those of you who may be interested in Health Corps Clinic, um, they, we will be offering uh, tours as part of CHP Week tomorrow. November 9th, 
at 2 o'clock and 5.30 p.m. Uh, registration is highly encouraged, and that can be done on our website at www.wichita.edu backslash CHP week. Um, Teresa, we actually have a token of appreciation Aww. we would like to present to you as our CHP Allied Health Week keynote speaker. Oh, thank you guys. <laughs> and Dean Bibbs, now I'm very humbled. <laughs> yeah, but, but I, I did, this isn't on the program, but um, I'm sitting there and I know everybody heard it. And I appreciate your being so open with us and telling your life story. See, here it comes up. <laughs> but uh, I so appreciate that. You told us what you came out of. You told us how you struggled. And then in giving us those key points, you absolutely told us what kept us going, what kept, keeps you going. But I want to ask you for something because last night there was an event that um, I was at, Gina was there, several of us were there, where high school students were coming through trying to figure out what they wanted to do. And one of the parents said to me, how do you tell when you're talking to somebody that says that they're interested in the health professions, how do you tell if that person really is? And you and I talked a little bit about this earlier and then you work for I don't know how long without any money. And I said to the father, I said, well, I asked them a lot of things, but if they're in it for the money, then I tell them to get out of it mm -hmm. because when the going gets tough, yeah. The money won't make a difference. So I'm mm -mm. just asking you, you're going to work for your gift. You already did. But <laughs> if you could just tell us just three things that motivate you, because I know it's not money. Mm -hmm. I know it's not recognition and accolades because you just said you're humbled. So what makes you keep going and what makes your family have to arrest you <laughs> to get you to stop and take care of yourself? But you could just give us three, three things that you know I, keep you going. I think one is my belief okay. uh, because I am very spiritual. And it's funny because I didn't grow up going to church. Uh, I wasn't baptized until I was 35. Uh, and... It, and the reason why I actually got baptized was because my daughter, she was like literally, we moved to Wichita when she was seven and she was like, mama, I got to go find a church home. And I'm looking at her like, really? So she found a church home, literally found a bus, the bus would come pick her up. And I should have been ashamed because I'm like, okay, baby. She'd get on downstairs and i go roll back into bed on Sunday mornings until one day she had so many kids that the bus couldn't pick all the kids up anymore. Mm. And so here I am, able body you know, it was an evening church night service. And so I'm like, ah, okay, let, <clears throat> let me take those kids to church. And when I went there, I was so touched. And, and I made that connection with the spiritual side of me, that belief part. Okay. So I think believing in something greater than you. Uh, the other part was, I think I've been running so hard from poverty and from, from breaking that cycle that I'm afraid to stop. Uh, I'm, a, I'm afraid to stop. And there, there were people who put things into me, like Ms. Zeering, Ms. Clay. You know, I, I feel like people were sent into my life for seasons and reasons, and they placed those little things in me that kept me moving forward. So it was other people who I saw cared enough about me, and, and I had nothing to give them. So it's like I couldn't pay you to care about me. And so, uh, so that's the other part. And then the probably the third one would be, I, wanna, I want my kids to have a wonderful future. Mm. And so I, not only do, do I want them to be educated and not only do I want them to have all of the benefits of, that come along with not being poor, you know, <laughs> that I think that pushes me. And so, you know, even though it was hard for me to send my daughter to Howard, you know, that was something that I knew would prepare her to have a different lifestyle and would prepare my future grandchildren to have a better life. And when I look at my kids now, I mean, my, my uh, son, when he was 10, he was out in the back of our house. Uh, we have a little pond back there. And so he had his little fishing rod knowing good and well he wasn't going to catch anything in that pond. But I thought about him at 10 years old feeling so safe that he could take a fishing pole and put it in a pond. And I thought about at nine years old, I was going through a war zone, picking my six-year-old brother up off the ground. And so I never wanted them to go through any of those things, but I want them to stand on my shoulders. So I truly think internally that's what pushes me. 
Well, so thank you for sharing that. Lupe said, you, Lupe said, you are you are a beautiful person, and we're just so excited. Now I'll let you, <laughs> but I, I just couldn't let you. <laughs> oh, that, that is very pieces. pretty. We're gonna wow. get a picture. We're, we're yeah. so excited because what you've done, and then I'll stop. What you've done tonight is you've poured yourself into us. You've shared and you've poured out, just like you talked about those people pouring into mm -hmm. you. And, and I'm not with you at clinic, but you're CEO, but I can literally see you walking around the waiting room, walking around the very areas, pouring your life mm -hmm. into people telling them you can make it if you want to. Yes. What do you want to do? What do you want to mm -hmm. be? And that is tremendous. So I so appreciate that. I want you to really hear how Thank much you. I appreciate that because that is, is a gift. Thank you. It's a gift. And, and I know that um, uh, yesterday I was in Chicago because I was at an tra oral health training. Ooh. Now that's some tough stuff, anybody in the oral health stuff, but that. Dental uh, hygiene's <laughs> in the house. <laughs> I know they had all that, so I know the difference between caries, where they need to be cav caviated, cavitated, whatever. So we got to that point and I was like, oh, looking at the mouth transform. But anyhow, when we were leaving from there, I took a group that was with me out in Chicago, because again, I'm from Chicago, and they had never been there. And so while we were walking, you know, there's a lot of homeless people in Chicago, but I walked by a man who was sitting there with his two babies, two little babies, and it was cold. I mean, it was like 40 degrees, and he had a blanket on him, and they had a cup, and they were begging for money. And so I stopped, and I asked him what their names were, and I prayed for them, and I gave them enough money to get a room for the night. And the one thing I told him was, don't let your children, don't teach your children this. Like, there has to be a better way. You just got to keep thinking. And so, you know, you got to give back and you got to pay it forward. And it was funny, the next day when I left, he was not out there with, with his kids. And so, you know, just, just pay it forward. And you never know, whatever seed you plant, you never know. Like, I'm sure Ms. Ziering, if she was alive today, she, she wouldn't even... You know, she was doing it out of the graciousness of her heart, and she was probably paying it for it because somebody probably touched her life at some point. So just pay it for it. Be you. Be authentic and share and, and be a part of somebody else's life and their success. So Thank you so much. Thank you, guys. <laughs> Thank you, Dean Biggs.